Okay, so welcome again, everyone. Today, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Leticia Tariel from ICFO uh, as a speaker in our colloquium. Let me introduce Leticia to you. Um, she uh, graduated in the, or uh, received her PhD 2008 in the, uh, which she, she did in the group of Christoph Salomon. She then moved on as postdoc to Tillman Esslinger's group at ETH and to um, Philippe Bouillet's group at Institut Optique in Bordeaux. Um, and in 2013, joined ICFO as a junior group re leader and was promoted to a group leader in 2020 and to the ICREA professor in 2022. Um, she received an ERC consolidator grant in 2020 and is working um, on a broad range of uh, topics in many body physics and cold atomic gases, and among them um, also quantum simulations of gauge theories. And I think this is also related to the title and topic of today's talk, engineering gauge theories with both the Einstein condensates. Please, we're looking forward to your talk. So thank you very much, uh, Clemens, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation uh, to join today uh, for the seminar. So I'm really very sorry that I could not make it in person, but I hope uh, that in the online talk I can still transmit uh, the type of physics that we have been doing in my group at ICFO over the COVID times. So I put uh, together this image here of the metropolitan area of Barcelona, where you can see ICFO. ICFO is uh, uh, here. It's not exactly in Barcelona, it's actually 20 kilometers uh, down the coast uh, in Castel de Fels and just 10 minute walk from this beautiful beach and the Mediterranean Sea. So what we study in my group are uh, bose einstein condensates and in my talk I want to show you our latest results on how we can use them to engineer particular types of uh, gauge theories. So as I said today, this is going to be a story about uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, which are beautiful systems of many quantum particles, very clean, very controlled, that we can use to make very neat measurements. Uh, but we are not going uh, to use them um, to do precision physics here, but instead to do quantum many body physics. And quantum many body physics is really the physics that appears when we have many uh, quantum particles that interact with each other and that give rise to nice emerging collective phenomena uh, this can be, for example, superfluidity in uh, quantum fluids, like in the oldest of all quantum fluids, liquid helium, or quantum magnetism or superconductivity in strongly correlated materials, like the type of physics that appears in this uh, high TC superconductor. And a few years ago, I would have stopped here on the type of uh, quantum many body physics that we are interested in. But over the last uh, years, we also started to get interested in uh, high energy physics problems. So basically, also the interactions between quarks and gluons that give rise to protons and neutrons. Also, how these protons and neutrons uh, um, binds to form nuclei and more complex structures like neutron stars. This is also a very interesting uh, quantum many body physics problem that maybe in the long term we can try to address uh, with uh, bose einstein condensates. So in my group in Barcelona, we work a bit on uh, all these different topics. So the first experiment that I set up here uh, uh, worked on the topic of uh, quantum fluids. So this is a system um, that is a mixture of uh, potassium bose einstein condensates that we do in our potassium lab. And uh, what uh, we did uh, a few years ago is to try to do an analog of uh, the liquid helium physics, but in a much, much, much more dilute setting. So this is the physics of quantum liquid droplets, which you heard about uh, from um, Hilman Fau, I think, a few weeks ago. And also, you know a lot about this uh, because uh, the group of Luis Santos has been working a lot on this uh, uh, type of uh, liquid droplet physics. Uh, over the COVID times, uh, we uh, started building a new experimental apparatus. So this is uh, an apparatus where we try to address uh, this uh, strongly correlated material physics. So it's a, a strontium uh, quantum gas experiment. Strontium uh, will be put in an optical lattice and we want to use the fermionic isotope, not for clock measurements, but actually to make uh, Hubbard models like the ones in this uh, high TC superconductor. But using the fact that strontium has many more internal states, we will be able to do more complicated uh, models. And this is a a project that uh, we hope will uh, start producing results very soon because this is what we achieved uh, this uh, week. So we now are quantum degenerate in this machine. We have a Bose-Einstein condensate. We are also setting up a lattice 
uh, microscope, we want to be able to see every atom in a lattice site and also with full spin resolution soon. So I hope 2023 will be the year when we start producing science in this machine. And this high energy physics uh, topic, this is actually our uh, most recent interest. And we just started this month a new machine. That's our Rydberg lab where we will want to um, uh, um, study this type of physics. Uh, but maybe just uh, going back to that, going back uh, to Bose-Einstein condensates our, our potassium experiment, you might wonder, okay, can we already start to do some type of uh, physics eventually relevant to high energy uh, with this type of system? And uh, you might also wonder how can one cold atom experimentalist working on ultra low temperature physics start to get interested into this uh, high energy physics. I want to show you that actually this is a natural uh, way, like there was a natural road how we got there. So uh, we make Bose-Einstein condensates and what we know how to do in the fields very well is how to subject it to artificial gauge fields, to synthetic vector potentials from which uh, you can derive an electric or a magnetic field such that you can make the particles of a Bose-Einstein condensate behave as charged particles, even though they are neutral. And this is a story that is almost as old as Bose-Einstein condensation itself, because as soon as BECs were made, uh, they were set into rotation. And the idea was to try to nucleate vortices to prove that the BECs were superfluid. But people realized very quickly that uh, the Coriolis force that the particles of the BEC experience in the rotating frame is formally analogous to a Lorentz force of a particle in a magnetic field. And actually the vortex lattices that you can see in such rotating BECs, they are uh, totally analogous to the vortex lattices, for example, in type two superconductors. Now uh, the field has been evolving and evolving and there are many methods to generate these synthetic gauge fields. Another one is to put atoms into an optical lattice and to shake it in the proper way using so-called Floquet engineering techniques. And here you can see uh, very nice experiments from the group of Immanuel Bloch in Munich, where they could see that when the atoms are subjected to a very strong magnetic field, they describe cyclotron orbits, and you can see directly these orbits closing up. And now if you make a magnetic field that goes in one direction or in the other direction, the direction of these orbits uh, just uh, inverts. And another technique that can be used uh, to generate synthetic gauge fields is so-called optical coupling. Uh, this is a technique pioneered by the group of Ian Spillman at JQI. And uh, what they did here is a system that is very similar to this one, but it's just a, a ribbon system with very sharp uh, boundaries. And what happens near the boundaries is that the cyclotron orbits, they cannot close up. Instead, they just skip off the wall. And then you get these skipping orbits that you can see here. Um, and this is an experiment that we like very much at ICFO because it uh, is built using an experimental technique that was proposed by the group of uh, Maciek Levenstein. So these are all beautiful experiments where you can make the quantum particles of a Bose-Einstein condensate behave as if they were charged. But while the particles in the BEC are really quantum, um, they are subjected to a gauge field that is really classical. It's a classical background for the atoms. So now when you have this, you can just uh, ask yourself, well, but the particles are quantum. What would happen if I make uh, my gauge fields also quantum? Yeah? And actually what you want to do is to turn this uh, vector potential that I told you about before into a quantum mechanical operator that will act on the matter particles and also to have back action of matter again into the gauge field. So you will do quantum gauge fields coupled to quantum uh, matter fields. And if you do that, of course, better you take the good quantum theory of fields. And it turns out that this is a uh, gauge theory. And that's where the high energy physics connection comes in because gauge theories, we know they are very fundamental theories for our understanding of nature. And they are the ones that describe the interactions between elementary particles as mediated by gauge bosons. Uh, but of course they appear in many, many other contexts of physics. Also gravity, general relativity um, is a gauge theory. Or if we go back to strongly correlated materials, uh, the low energy physics, uh, can very often be uh, described by effective gauge theories. This is the case for high TC superconductors, but also for uh, spin liquids or for spin ice. Yeah? And maybe you are not interested in all these uh, physics topics, but you are more into quantum information processing. Well, then you should also care about gauge theories because the famous Kitaev uh, Torex code, it's a gauge theory. It's a Z2 lattice gauge theory. 
So I hope I have uh, convinced, at least I did my best, uh, that if we could get our Bose-Einstein condensate speak this language of gauge theories, actually we could vastly expand the scope of problems that we could uh, tackle with these systems. And this is what uh, motivates us to open these uh, gauge theory books and try to learn what are the key ingredients that one needs to implement in an experiment in order to make uh, the cold atoms implement a gauge theory. And uh, the best is to look at the gauge theory that we all know best about, which is quantum electrodynamics, which is a theory that belongs to the class of dynamical gauge theories. And you see that to implement it in an experiment, you need to implement three key ingredients. So you need a system that has both matter and gauge degrees of freedom. For QED, we need to simulate the electrons and the photons, the matter and the gauge field. Then both need to be minimally coupled. So that means that one needs to replace in the uh, kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, the uh, momentum operator by P minus A. And then the last key ingredient is that, of course, we need the electrical charge to be conserved. That means that the theory needs to be gauge invariant. And that implies that the electric uh, field, so the gauge field and the matter field, needs to be linked in every point of space and time by a local conservation law that for QED is nothing else than Gauss law. And actually, while these two ingredients are relatively straightforward to implement in an experiment, you could take uh, two different uh, uh, species and this minimal coupling I showed you, uh, we know how to make it uh, already for the classical gauge fields. Implementing this third ingredient in the experiment is really uh, not so easy because it leads to very constrained dynamics between matter and gauge fields. Uh, still, I mean, there have been many theory proposals in the field on how one should try to do that uh, theoretically. But over the last years, AMO experiments have done a lot of progress in this direction. And starting from key ingredients or building blocks, really very small systems where these three ingredients are kept very well under control. Now they have scaled up uh, to uh, the realization of uh, complete gauge theories. And indeed, we have implementations of quantum electrodynamics, QED, in one plus one dimension, so one spatial dimension and one temporal dimension. Uh, in uh, three different experimental platforms, trapped ions, Rydberg atom arrays, and cold atoms in optical lattices. And what all these experiments do is QED uh, in a lattice. This is called the Schwinger model. And uh, with ions, uh, experiments started with very, very small systems uh, of four ions, six ions. Now they have been able to scale up to bigger systems using uh, special uh, preparation term techniques, uh, variational quantum simulation. And uh, Rydberg atoms also can make um, uh, a version of this uh, Schwinger model called the PXP model in larger systems. But really, the uh, biggest platform, the one that is most successful so far, are um, uh, atoms in optical lattices. And they are very impressive experiments from the uh, PAN group, first in Heidelberg, now uh, also in China, uh, where they realize uh, this uh, QED model with uh, almost 100 uh, particles, and even now in a setup that allows to see every single atom individually using a quantum gas microscope. This is this very recent paper uh, from a few weeks ago. So now all these experiments, they look at, let's say, page one um, of uh, the uh, quantum uh, field theory books, which is uh, realizing quantum electrodynamics. They are restricted to one dimension. And now the big challenge in the field is to scale these implementations to two dimensions or also to more complex uh, theories. Because if at the end, what we want, uh, for example, is to understand uh, QCD, so quantum chromodynamics, how nuclei interact and so on, we really need these experiments to go beyond what is done so far. Uh, and uh, actually, in my group, we thought that it would be very interesting to look at these quantum field theory books and not stay uh, with QED, but go to other uh, theories. And actually, we even uh, started to check uh, uh, quantum field theory books uh, for uh, many body systems for um, uh, description of uh, strongly correlated material systems. And we got interested in a special type of gauge theory that is called, uh, uh, this type of gauge theories are called topological gauge theories. The most famous example of uh, which is uh, what is called Chern-Simons theory. And when you look at Chern-Simons theory, the ingredients that give rise to it are very similar to QED. So you still have a system with matter and gauge degrees of freedom. And these two types of fields need to be minimally coupled. 
What is different is actually the local conservation law, which is not anymore Gauss law, but instead uh, this relation between uh, the magnetic field of the system and the matter density, which is called flux attachment. So now to understand what this theory is about, the best is to look at an example, a physical example, and the most uh, uh, famous uh, physics system where this chern simons theory appears is uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect. This chern simons theory is an effective theory for fractional quantum Hall states. So systems of quantum particles uh, that are uh, confined in a two-dimensional plane and subjected to a very strong uh, magnetic field. Now, in the presence of this strong magnetic field, these systems, they become very strongly correlated uh, uh, systems because the kinetic uh, energy is very strongly quenched. And uh, we know that for particular feeling factors, some uh, interesting uh, quantum many body systems appear, uh, which are the fractional quantum Hall states, where basically we have many body systems that have excitations that when we exchange two of them, they are not behaving like bosons or like fermions. So they are not like having the wave function that stays the same upon exchange or that inverts its sign, but instead uh, we can have any phase that it's picked up by this exchange uh, process. That's why these excitations, they are called anions. There are many efforts in the uh, quantum gas community to study these fractional quantum Hall states directly by putting particles, subjecting them to a very strong uh, magnetic field and trying to see the emergence of this uh, anionic behavior. But as an experimentalist, I also like to have an intuition of what uh, this um, uh, and ionic behavior is about and what these states are about and try to build some uh, effective single particle picture of what's uh, going on. And actually there is a very nice effective single particle picture of these uh, fractional quantum Hall states, which is of course not mine. It's actually an idea from Vilcek that comes uh, from uh, as old as the paper in which he introduced the concept of anions and builds in an idea that is called uh, flux attachment. And what is this flux attachment idea of Vilcek? It actually consists of replacing the strongly interacting particles of fractional quantum Hall states by some new particles, these uh, orange particles that you see here, and put all the effect of the strong correlations in the system into the fact that these weakly interacting particles, they will grab part of the external magnetic field and attach it to them. So these are these uh, solenoids or flux tubes that you see here. And now if you go in the system of composite particles formed by these uh, weakly interacting orange particles and the solenoids attached to them, then you get effectively a weakly interacting system, but you can reproduce the physics of fractional uh, quantum uh, Hall states, because now if you take two of these composite particles and you exchange them, for example, then you are exchanging uh, solenoids and you have an Aronoff bomb phase associated to that. And that's, for example, where the anionic phase uh, comes from. So this, uh, Theory um, uh, is actually very nice to get an intuition about uh, fractional quantum Hall physics and a very important quantity on it is the magnetic field created by all the solenoids that uh, you see because each of these uh, orange particles will have a solenoid stuck to it uh, is going to be a magnetic field that is proportional uh, to the matter density. And now the theory that describes how this these uh, orange particles are coupled to the gauge field that gives rise to all these solenoids is called chern simons theory. It's a gauge theory that in many aspects is very similar to uh, QED because we have uh, matter and gauge field that are minimally coupled, but it's also different in one key uh, aspect, which is that the uh, gauge field cannot propagate itself if matter is not there. And that's because the solenoids are always stuck to matter. Uh, so you can think of that as photons that are very, very heavy. They have like really large mass, so they can only move when matter uh, drags them around. And you could also think that then if I remove matter, then my theory becomes trivial and it's not necessarily the case. Uh, this depends on the topology of the space. If the space has a non-trivial topology, then there can be non-trivial solutions for this gauge field. And that's why Chern simons theory is uh, called a topological uh, gauge theory. So now uh, it would be actually very nice if one could uh, engineer in a control system uh, this type of theory, because that would be a way of getting anionic behavior, but without strong correlations, just in a weakly interacting system. I think this is actually a, an old dream from the condensed matter community. And there are many uh, theory proposals on 
how one could maybe achieve that. This is one that I like uh, particularly, but of course there are other ones. And having uh, ultra cold atoms, we could try to just implement uh, these type of ideas. Um, actually, I will disappoint you immediately. We are not able yet to make a Trans-Simon theory in our experiments, the same as we don't know how to do QED in two dimensions or three dimensions, for example. But uh, what we can do is the reduction of this theory uh, to one spatial dimension and one temporal dimension. So that's basically the effective theory for the edge of this system, which is called the chiral BF theory. You can think uh, of this, I like the Schwinger model of topological gauge theory. So like the simplest, uh, gauge theory of this class that gives you already some non-trivial ingredients and that has uh, the basic components to understand how to make these uh, theories in the lab. And this is also a theory that has uh, some uh, very nice properties. So if you look at this uh, fractional quantum whole state and now you check its edge, what will happen is that particles will be able to go um, to propagate without dispersion when they move in one direction, but not in the opposite one. These are like these uh, skipping orbits, these edge states that I showed at the very beginning of my introduction. But now these edge states will come from interactions between the particles. And this uh, uh, theory restricted to the edge has this type of chiral many body edge states. So with this, I uh, finish with my introduction and I would like to tell you uh, a bit uh, to give you the outline of my talk. So first, uh, I will want to describe uh, the theory of how we actually find a scheme to encode this chiral BF uh, theory in a system that we can make in the lab, which is a Raman coupled bose einstein condensate. And then I will move to show you experiments that we do with uh, uh, such chiral bose einstein condensates. So bose einstein condensates ruled by this chiral BF theory. So let me start from the beginning, from the theory. So how uh, we can actually make this type of uh, model in the lab. So let me go back to the chiral BF theory. So this is the theory, as I told you, that you get if you take a 2D Trans-Simon theory and you reduce to one spatial dimension. So you basically remove the Y direction and you restrict yourself to the edge of this system. So this is a theory that was proposed in the 90s by Silvio Rabello and was studied in much more detail in subsequent years by Roman Jakif and collaborators. Uh, what you have in the original Trans-Simon theory is a matter field. Uh, which is coupled to a gauge field that has three components. So the temporal component and two spatial components. And now when we remove the Y direction, the Y component of the gauge field is gone. And we have to replace it by another scalar field uh, that is actually proportional to AY and it's called B because it's bosonic. So uh, in order to simulate this theory, of course, we need to know uh, what its Lagrangian is. So this is the expression that uh, all these theory papers uh, give you, which I have to say, it's very complicated. At least that's the, what I thought uh, the first time I saw it. So let me uh, guide you through it. So the first two terms, actually, they are pure gauge field terms. Uh, so the first one reads uh, B, this uh, bosonic scalar field, times F, F is the electromagnetic field tensor. So this uh, BF is what gives the name uh, of the theory. And it's different from electromagnetism, that would be FF. And then the second term, this is what gives this name chiral to the theory. What it is, is actually a term that needs to be added to this theory when you reduce from two dimension to one dimension to make sure that you have this behavior in the edges that particles can only move in one direction and not in the opposite one. Then the next two terms, actually, these are much more familiar. Uh, you should be recognizing here a uh, minimal coupling between the matter and the gauge field. So it's P minus A uh, in the temporal component and in the spatial component that we left. And then this last term is also very simple. This is really the interactions between the matter fields. Uh, we took uh, bosonic uh, matter fields. So these are proportional to the matter density. So still, I try to guide you through these terms, but if we want to make this thing in the lab, it looks very complicated because we have a matter field and two uh, other fields, gauge field and scalar field. So we need a trick uh, to simplify the problem. And the trick actually comes from this local conservation law of the theory that links uh, matter fields and gauge fields. So that's like the Gauss law for uh, QED or this flux attachment condition for Trans-Simon theory. So in this chiral BF theory, what this local conservation law tells you is that the electric field is going to be uh, uh, proportional 
to the time derivative of the matter density. And also there is a relation for this B field and the matter density. So now if we use these relations and we replace here, then we will get a much simpler uh, system to simulate because it will only depend on matter. So this is a trick that is called technically encoding in matter. So it's using the local conservation laws to remove all the gauge and scalar fields and get the theory only with uh, matter fields. Fields. And this is not a trick that we invented. It's actually uh, how the trapped ion experiments simulate uh, the Schrodinger model. And if you do that, actually, uh, for example, for the Schrodinger model for QED, you can think you have these trapped ions. This is the matter, and they interact because they exchange photons. Now, if you remove the photons, you need to replace that. So there is a price to pay. You will get some new interactions between the matter. And for QED, it's natural you get Coulomb interactions for uh, your matter. If we do this trick for our chiral BF theory, we will get uh, matter fields with some new emergent interactions, which Jakif called chiral. It's actually what you see here. So we have uh, matter fields, that's their kinetic term. And this is the standard interaction term, just uh, density, density interactions, just that's the contact interactions, the collisional interactions of uh, standard bosonic fields. And here we get this additional term that involves the matter density, but also the current operator for the matter. Now, to build an intuition of what this current density term means, what is nice is to have a look at what would happen for a classical wave packet. So if you have a matter wave packet, the current is nothing else than the velocity of the wave packet times the density. So h bar k over n times the density. So if you replace here, what you get is that its interaction term looks like a standard collisional interaction term, but with a coupling constant, like effective scattering length, that depends on the momentum of the, of the particles. And actually, this means that you will have interactions that are different if you're wave packet is moving in one direction or the other one. So that means that uh, it's this uh, wave packet is not going to be uh, its mirror image. Yeah? And that's why these interactions are called chiral. It's a pretty funky interaction term because basically it tells you that the interactions depend on the velocity. So it's a term that explicitly breaks uh, Galilean invariance. So now how do we make this uh, in the lab? So we take a Bose-Einstein condensate a Bose-Einstein condensate with two internal states that I will call in the following spin up and spin down or uh, blue atoms and green atoms. And then you uh, merge these states, you, you couple them with two photon uh, Raman transitions that couple uh, these two uh, states. Now, if you are in the initially in the blue state to flip the spin to the green state, you need to absorb a photon from these Raman beams and re-emit in the other one. So you will get a momentum kick, which is twice the momentum imparted by one Raman beam. That's why if I go to the rotating frame, I will have dispersion of the blue particles and of the green particles, and they will be a space by 2KR. And of course, the natural energy scale uh, in this process is also the recoil energy that I wrote here. Now, when you put coupling between these two states uh, uh, with omega, the Rabi frequency, if you make omega very large, you actually get uh, dress atom photon uh, states. Um, and for very large coupling, they look like parabolic uh, dispersion relation, the two. And uh, these are the two dress states that I would call minus and plus. So in the following, we will be restricting ourselves to the lowest stress state. And you see that it looks like very standard particles, except that they have a spin composition uh, that depends um, on momentum uh, that I have encoded here in this color scale. So uh, for negative, uh, large negative momentum, atoms are mostly in the up state and for large positive momentum, on the down state or green state. But of course, if I don't look what's the internal state of the atoms, I just check what happens with the superposition, then it just looks like a, a standard particle no? with a parabolic dispersion. And this is a trick that was pioneered by Ian Spielman. It's very nice because now, if you just don't give to your Raman uh, photons uh, enough energy to join the two states, so for example, um, sorry, uh, you put a detuning uh, for one of these uh, uh, Raman beams, then uh, what happens is that the minima of the dispersion just shift, and actually you get a shift of the position of the minimum here, 
And this looks very much like uh, particles subjected to a, a vector potential, and that's what you use to engineer uh, a gauge field. Yeah? And this shift is actually proportional uh, to the detuning of uh, your two um, photon Raman process. Now, how do we turn this, uh, this uh, system into a setup that allows you to make a gauge theory? Actually, you, it's very simple. You just need to put interactions between the particles. So interactions between the up atoms that I will uh, parameterize by this coupling constant G up up, and between the down atoms by this uh, coupling constant G down down. And there is a trick that is that you need to put this coupling constant uh, to be different. So now, if I go into the simplest configuration, which is to consider interactions between uh, these atoms in a mean field approximation, and I put these interactions to be different, you see immediately what's happening. So basically, the energy of the upstate uh, atoms is shifted by the interactions between themselves by this quantity g up up times uh, the density. And for the down atoms, the same happens, but uh, this shift uh, can be different. If g down down is bigger than g up up, then this shift is uh, larger. And now uh, you see that if my Raman process initially was on resonance, now when I put these interactions, it's not anymore. And uh, basically you will get a detuning for this uh, Raman process that it's of many body origin. It's nothing else that the differential mean field shift um, of uh, that interactions give to this uh, transition. And now, uh, you are going to get a vector potential uh, synthetic gauge field that is density dependent uh, because this detuning depends on the matter density. Now, this is uh, not our idea. This is an idea that was proposed uh, quite some years ago by the group of uh, Patrick Oberg. Uh, Luis uh, Santos knows this very well because he's author in this paper and they came up with the Hamiltonian of the system uh, subjected to this two photon Raman process in the presence of these uh, different interactions that turns out to be exactly the one of this uh, chiral BF theory in its classical version. Huh? So you see, uh, uh, here, this density dependent vector potential will give you this minimal coupling uh, which uh, with A that depends on density. And this is exactly the Hamiltonian that we want for the gauge theory. So we had a look at uh, this problem, but actually we approach it uh, from a different direction, different perspective, because what we thought is what happens when we put atoms in this uh, tress state and we just look what are the effective interaction between the atoms in this um, in this uh, uh, dress state. And what you see is that actually when uh, the atoms have large negative momentum, they are mostly in the up state. So they should have the interactions of uh, the up up atoms. So this value here. Now, when they have large positive momentum, they are mostly in the green state, in the down spin state. So they should have interactions uh, like the ones of the green atoms. This is here. And you see that you need to interpolate between these two limits and you will interpolate between both uh, smoothly as a function of momentum. So you will have effective interactions between these atoms that are in the coherent superposition that will depend on their momentum. And for a big range of momenta, they will depend uh, linearly on uh, the momentum of the wave packet. Yeah, and this uh, linear relation will be a very good approximation in a big range of this curve. So actually that tells you that in between these stress atoms, we have interactions that look like contact interactions, like collisional interactions, but with a coupling constant that is linearly dependent on the momentum and with a prefactor that just uh, depends on the difference of the interactions of the pair states without the coupling. And now once you have that, actually, uh, you can uh, do the math, uh, not hind wavingly, but just in a bit more formal way. Uh, we did so following an idea uh, uh, from the group of Ian Spielman, which is just to take the interaction Hamiltonian of your system and restrict yourself to the slowest uh, state. And the result that you get uh, at a given momentum just expanded in series of K, um, uh, which is a very good approximation. You can stop the series to a first order if the momentum spread of the BC is small. And this is uh, the Hamiltonian that we get, which is exactly the same that Louis got uh, many years ago, but now not uh, the classical limit of it, but the quantum limit of it. So we have uh, quantum uh, operators all around here. And the only uh, price to pay that we have is that actually, um, 
in the direction of the Raman coupling, if we don't put omega very, very large, we actually will replace the mass of the particles by an effective mass. But other than that, this is exactly the Hamiltonian that we wanted. So uh, with this, uh, we have an ingredient to make this uh, chiral BF theory in the lab. So let's see uh, how we can do it in the experiment. So in our experiment, we use Bose-Einstein condensates of potassium-39. Potassium-39 is an atom that we like very much because it has many Feshbach resonances that allow us, us to tune the interatomic interactions and in particular to turn them into the chiral interactions that we want to make this gauge theory. And we specifically use potassium-39 in two spin states as uh, our uh, blue spins and uh, green spins or spin up and spin down are the uh, F equals one and F equals zero and one plus one uh, states of potassium 39. And we work at magnetic fields around 385 uh, Gauss uh, because in this magnetic field window, we are on the flank of a flashback resonance for the green uh, state. So we can, by changing a bit the magnetic field, uh, tune uh, the green uh, scattering length. Uh, while for the blue atoms, we have very small scattering length that can be either positive or negative, depending on the exact magnetic field value that we choose. So we have this very large difference in scattering length that we wanted. And then the interactions between the up and down spins, actually in this type of system, they don't matter because this in the two photon Raman process is something, it's common mode to the two states. But it turns out that here in this window of magnetic fields that we use, they're also fairly small and they are slightly attractive. So what our experiment does is that we prepare a Bose-Einstein condensate. We subject it to these Raman coupling beams. For these experiments, we take counter-propagating beams with cross polarizations and the magnetic field is along uh, the vertical direction. This magnetic field we use to tune the interactions uh, with the Feshbach resonance to have the scattering lengths that I said here. And then we want to make a theory that is effectively 1D uh, because we want to make this model for the edge of the system. This chiral BF theory is a 1D theory. So we confine the atoms strongly uh, in the transversal direction using an optical waveguide. So a single beam uh, optical dipole trap. So this means that all the dynamics we will be looking at is one dimensional. It's along uh, this waveguide. And then uh, to see uh, the atoms, we have a high numerical aperture. Uh, lens and we do in situ imaging. So in all experiments, actually all images that I will be showing, they are taken uh, keeping the Raman beams on, uh, keeping the uh, optical waveguide on, but just having or releasing um, uh, a longitudinal confinement that we produce with another beam. So how do we uh, work with this system? So the first thing that we do is actually to take our BC and adiabatically load it into the lowest uh, uh, dress state uh, with the atom and photons on, so of the Raman beams. So here in the minimum of this dispersion. And now to show that uh, the system is chiral with respect to interactions, what we need to do is to give momentum to the atoms. And this we do uh, by adding an additional pair of counter-propagating beams, which are collinear with these ones, with which we induce uh, um, uh, two photon transitions that go back to the lowest stress state. So really a Bragg process. We can absorb and re-emit a beam um, here and just use it to kick the atoms uh, to the right direction to large uh, positive momenta, or if we change uh, the relative frequency of the beams, we can just uh, kick them uh, to the negative momentum direction. And then after that, after kicking the atoms, what we will do is that we will remove any longitudinal uh, confinement along the waveguide, and we will let the atoms propagate in this waveguide and take uh, images uh, in situ with our high NA lens. So when we do that, this is uh, what we find. So this is what we find when we have kicked the atoms and let them propagate in the waveguide uh, to the right or to the left. And you should immediately see in these images, which are taken at different uh, times, that when we kick atoms to the right, then they start to expand in this waveguide uh, because we have removed the confinement. While when we kick them to the left, something completely different happens because the atoms are just keeping their shape. So you see here immediately that we have made uh, some chiral system because the left and the right propagation directions are different. So it's a system that 
is different from its mirror image. And you can see it a bit better if you look at the uh, size of the cloud along the longitudinal direction. You see when we kick uh, atoms right, their size increases over time, and we kick them left, the size remains uh, constant. So why is this happening? Actually, microscopically, it's very simple. It's because we actually um, uh, kick the atoms, and when we kick them to the right, then we are uh, creating a system that has effective repulsive interactions. So when we release the atoms, they have uh, this interaction uh, energy to release along the waveguide. That's why they are expanding. While when we kick them to the left, the system has effective attractive interactions, and that's holding the atoms together. And actually what happens is that we have attractive interactions that hold the atoms together. Their effect is compensated by the quantum pressure that makes a repulsive force that goes in the opposite direction. So we actually form a bright solid on a self-bound uh, matter wave packet that can propagate without dispersion, maintaining its shape over all uh, this time. Huh? So now we have made uh, this uh, uh, soliton when we kicked atoms to the left, and we would like to know whether there is anything special with this uh, soliton. So to check uh, what happens to this soliton, what we decided is to uh, build a wall for it. Of course, it's not a real wall. It's a, a repulsive laser beam that we focus to the side of the cloud, and then just launch the atoms against this wall. And when we do so, this is what we find. So we find that initially our soliton is happily moving towards the wall. And now when it reaches the wall, it bounces off because uh, this uh, barrier is so high that the atoms cannot tunnel through. So they are reflected. But when they are reflected, they just um, uh, stop being a soliton and start to expand. So we have... Uh, this looks like a particle that happily moves to the left, but when it bounces off the wall, it disappears, it, it dissociates. Huh? So you could wonder, as experimentalists, we should always be naive experimentalists, well, whether our wall is not doing something but to the solitons, that's why they are expanding. But the nice thing with potassium is that you can take one of these spin states and go just a few gauss uh, uh, away in magnetic field and have a system with a single component and very similar attractive interactions. And then if we launch these uh, standard solitons uh, against the wall, we see that they bounce against the wall and they still come up like a soliton. So the fact that in the Raman couple system, we have uh, the soliton that disappears when it bounces off the wall is telling us that the solitons are different. The solitons are actually chiral. They are solitons that only exist for one propagation direction and they don't exist uh, for the other one. And actually, uh, these chiral solitons, they were predicted as one of the main properties of this uh, chiral BF theory uh, using uh, all these gauge theory formalism. So what we say is that these uh, solitons that we see here, actually they are the realization in the lab of these chiral solitons that were predicted in the 90s. So I still have a little bit of time left. So I want to tell you about uh, another aspect of this uh, chiral BF theory which is uh, how we should observe the gauge field associated to this gauge theory. And you could think that, okay, we are done for that. We cannot do that because we use this local conservation law to remove all gauge fields and leave everything in terms of matter. So now how are we going to recover this gauge field? Actually, this is not really true. Uh, there is a trick that we can use uh, that we learned from the trapped ion experiments, which is actually to use exactly this local conservation law to reconstruct what the field is about. Because we know that this makes a relation between the gauge field and the matter field. So now if we measure the matter field and how it changes over time, then we can directly see what the gauge field uh, was. So. What we expect in this system, you see this equation, is that when we change the density, that's going to make that the system self-generates an electric field, and this will back act on the behavior of the matter. And we decided to change the density in the experiment uh, in a way that we can make a very uh, big uh, change of it, which is letting the cloud expand. So basically what we did here was to prepare uh, atoms in the lowest stress state, but instead of using these Bragg beams to kick it, to give him some momentum, we did not give any momentum. We just 
at t equals zero, switch off the longitudinal confinement and let the atoms expand in this waveguide. And when we do so, we see that something funny happens because the cloud starts to expand in the waveguide, but it expands in a a uh, funny way because it expands much more in one direction than in the other one. So we have these tails that occur in the density profile of the cloud uh, that becomes very asymmetric. And you can see it better if you just integrate along the vertical direction and you fit these curves uh, just um, here with a, with a skewed Gaussian. You see that initially uh, we have a symmetric uh, Gaussian and then over time, then we have this tail that appears. So why is this happening? Actually, it's very easy to understand it microscopically. This happens because we have atoms in a superposition between the up and the down state, between the blue and the green, but these states have very different interactions. So now when at t equals zero, we let the atoms expand in the waveguide, in the superposition, the blue atoms will tend to go to the left and the green atoms to the right. But now the green atoms, they have much more interaction energy to release. So they will uh, fly faster, and then further, and that's uh, what is going to give this asymmetric uh, distribution uh, to the density that we see here. But of course, if I have imaging that does not see whether atoms are in the blue or the green state, I just look at the total density. Um, I would not know that, I would not know that, but actually I can also have an interpretation of that in terms of electric field, because when I let the atoms expand, what is going to happen is that the density in the center of the cloud will drop and the density in the edges will increase uh, just to have continuity equation fulfilled. And now this is going to give rise to an electric field that will point in one direction in the center of the cloud and the opposite direction in the sides because here density decreases, but here density increases. And also this increase will be different in the two sides. So that will give rise to different electric forces here. And now you see you will have a complicated distribution of forces in your cloud. You will pull more here than you are pushing here. And that's what is going to give you this asymmetric uh, shape for the cloud after expansion. So this is a very hand wavy picture, but actually what is nice is that we can use our theory uh, to predict that. And uh, the formal theory gives you essentially the same. So what are you seeing here? So the dashed line, is a, a simulation for the expansion of the uh, complete system. So the atoms in the two states that are coupled with this Raman beams. Um, and the solid line is actually the effective theory that we have, this chiral BF theory. You see the two theories are agreeing very well over time and they are just giving you this asymmetric expansion. And these black arrows are the uh, distribution of electric forces that we compute from uh, the effective theory. And you see that they really have this exact uh, um, distribution that I was telling you before, and that's what is driving this asymmetric expansion. So long story short, what we are saying is that if we see asymmetric uh, clouds like these ones, if we quantify this asymmetry uh, from it, we can say that there was this uh, self-generated electric field that came from the change of matter density. And then we would get this back action between the matter and the gauge field. So we just quantify this asymmetry by looking at the skewness parameter of our cloud, which is nothing else at the third uh, central momentum of the distribution divided by the second uh, moment, central momentum uh, cubed. Yeah, And this skewness parameter uh, is zero for a symmetric cloud. So it would be zero here. And it's positive when you have um, a tail to the right and it's negative if you have the tail to the other direction. So we take all these images and we plot uh, the skewness parameter that we measure over time in the expansion. And you see that initially you have no skewness and then the skewness develops over the expansion until it saturates because expansion became ballistic. And the points are really our measurements and the solid line is what you expect from a full simulation of the system. So this is for a particular set of Raman couplic parameters. If we change those, uh, you get, uh, for example, here, uh, the pink points. And uh, when we saw this, we were extremely surprised because we were always expecting this asymmetry to arise because we always have this different interaction between the two states, but we could see for some parameters that this skewness was completely gone. So I have to say when we saw this, uh, we thought something was wrong on the experiment, but then we did the numerics and the numerics was predicting exactly the same. Um, so uh, we thought a bit more and then we understood what was going on. And what was going on is that there are two contributions to the cloud asymmetry over the expansion. 
One is this effect of the chiral interactions that gives rise to this electric field. So this is the gauge theory prediction. This is what we want to see. But there can also be kinetic effects because I told you if omega is not super large, uh, we have an effective mass uh, for the atoms, for the kinetic term. Uh, and this effective mass uh, can depend on the momentum of the particles. And now if the particles are having are heavier effectively if they are moving in one direction or the other one, then of course that's also going to skew uh, the density distribution. And what happens in this uh, plot is that basically uh, for uh, the violet uh, points here, uh, we have these kinetic effects that tend to skew the distribution in the same direction as the interactions. So the two effects are adding up together. So we see maximal skewness and in the other condition for the pin points, the two effects are going in opposite directions, so they are canceling each other, and that's why we don't see any asymmetry developing. But of course, uh, what we should do is to go in a configuration where these connective effects uh, disappear, and uh, we can ignore them, and this is what happens if you go to uh, zero detuning for the Raman process. Um, this is single particle detuning, of course, not taking into account interactions. And if we do that, we see that we still have an asymmetric distribution because the asymmetry is only given by the effect that we want to see, which are these chiral interactions. So uh, the fact that we see in this expansion that the clouds become asymmetric uh, is really telling us that the system self-generate an electric field and that there is back action between the matter and the gauge fields, which is uh, what we wanted to see. And actually our model for predicting this chiral BF theory tells us that in the regime of parameters where we are here, we should really go into this uh, zero detuning condition for the mapping to be valid. And otherwise we have additional uh, terms that go out of the mapping. So this is what we are exactly seeing in the experiment. Okay, so with this, I really come to the conclusion of my talk. So I wanted to show you that uh, ultra cold atoms and Bose-Einstein condensates are really reaching up this uh, regime of simulating gauge theories. Uh, we are very far still from simulating high energy physics, from simulating QCD, nuclei, and so on, but we are doing baby steps in this direction. And in my group, um, we uh, investigated uh, what are called so-called topological gauge theories, and in particular, the reduction of uh, the most famous uh, theory of this class, which is the Chern-Simons theory, uh, to one dimension that is called the Chiral BF theory. And uh, we could see the main ingredients of this theory that were predicted uh, many years ago uh, in a different context, which are chiral interactions. So a system that has a different interactions when it moves in one direction or the other one. Um, and uh, these chiral interactions actually are linear in momentum as they should be for this theory to occur. And we can see the two main manifestations, which is that we have chiral solitons, so a self-bound matter wave packets uh, when we propagate in one direction, but not in the other direction. And also, uh, that the system, when we change the density, self-generates an electric field that gives rise to these asymmetric density distributions. And now there are many things that we could do with this system, still staying with this Carol BF theory and uh, this uh, class of topological gauge theories. One thing that we would really like uh, to have a look at is to try to see uh, remnants on anion uh, physics uh, in these one-dimensional systems. So actually this theory was originally proposed as a theory where you could have something similar to the anions uh, of the two-dimensional system, but just in a line, so-called linear anion models, which is uh, something that uh, was uh, discussed uh, quite in detail in literature in the 90s, but has been revived in the context of cold atoms in optical lattices. And Luis group has done many, many works on that. So. I would be very happy to discuss at some point uh, with you about uh, how we could try to see some of these physics in the continuum. So the system that we do is actually a continuum limit of uh, these uh, anion Hubbard models uh, that have been studied in the community. Another thing that we are actually studying right now theoretically before doing experiments is to see what happens if instead of doing this theory in a line, you do it in a ring. So you just close uh, the system. And this is interesting, as was already uh, mentioned in the original paper uh, 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 in 2013, because then you cannot uh, completely remove all degrees of freedom. So you have a magnetic field, magnetic flux that pierces the ring that can remain. And this is going uh, to give you um, currents in your system that will depend on the number of particles. So you could have a different uh, currents in your ring uh, when you change the atom number and jump from one 
current one angular momentum mode to another one. So it's a way of getting magnetic degrees of freedom, even though your system is still uh, one dimensional and it's accessible. And what is very nice is that we think this is something that we could do in the experiment, because instead of taking counter propagating Raman beams, we could do this Raman coupling uh, with beams that have orbital angular momentum, and uh, we could see this type of physics. So we are uh, working on a theory proposal that we hope will be able to be implemented in our experiment. And then, of course, the big goal is to go from just one dimension to two dimensions. And there are already ideas of what, how one should do that. Uh, these are proposals from the group of uh, uh, Patrick Oberg. Um, uh, using the same uh, angular momentum beams, but now applied to a full uh, two-dimensional system. And with this, I really want to show you uh, my group and give credit to the people that did this experiment. So these are all experiments that are done in my uh, quantum fluids lab, the potassium lab, and the main people behind the measurements uh, were two PhD students, uh, Annika uh, and Craig. Craig is here in the picture, and two postdocs, Eletra and Ramon. You see Ramon uh, here too. Um, and their work, of course, built very much upon the work of previous PhD students in the group, Fesar and Julio. And we had a very strong uh, theory collaboration with the team of Alessio uh, Celli at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, with whom we are now preparing other proposals on how to continue on that. And as I said, in my group, we have another lab, that's the strontium lab, that's the lattice lab that got their BEC this week. And we are starting a Rydberg lab again to push more in the direction of quantum simulation of gauge theories. So with this, I would like uh, to thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to answer questions.